This is Raul Lopez, and you're listening to How Do You Say Success in Spanglish? The path to success isn't easy. For minorities and people of color, many attempt this journey with little to no guidance. Join me as I sit down with individuals who share their stories of perseverance so that together we can learn how to say success in Spanglish. What's good, mi gente? This is your boy, Raul. For today's episode, things are going to be a little different. I had surgery done this week. I had the gastric sleeve surgery, bariatric surgery, to help with my journey to continue health and uh, weight loss. Um, And I haven't really been feeling well all week to be able to get much work done, get my audio edited and ready and prepped and all my media stuff. So I figured I'd take this opportunity to kind of talk uh, late, definitely doing this kind of last minute. So, but I figured I just kind of wanted to be real for a little bit. And I think talk about a topic that a lot of us take for granted and it's our health. We sometimes forget that we're vulnerable and we're not, we're, we're mortals and we don't take care of ourselves and we think we're invisible, especially when we're young. And we do a lot of stupid things. Um, for me, I've been overweight just about pretty much my whole life and countless attempts to lose weight and countless attempts of actually losing weight. I had lost there was plenty of times where I've lost 50, 60 pounds and we're super proud of myself. And I, I, that's actually, I was at one of my lightest when I met my wife when I was doing a lot of boxing back in the day. So, um, but with time, you know, things kind of fall off, you get lazy, you get distracted, you get busy and you have other things that are important. Um, you tend to kind of always go and focus on what's more important. And sometimes you don't put yourself on that list. I have to get a better job. I got to work more. I got to have fun. I got to take care of my family, you know? things you like to do and sometimes that comes and hits you like a brick wall and forces you to kind of change your entire outlook on things and change what you do moving forward for me that happened a couple of years ago it was uh, my 39th birthday and it was right before my 39th birthday it was right after covid this was in I believe 2021, just getting off the long COVID haul, being stuck at home, working from home for the last, I don't know how long it was by that point. I had known I gained weight. I've been sitting in sweatpants. I mean, I wasn't, when I moved up here from Connecticut, from Texas, sorry, to Connecticut, I was at about 299 pounds. Uh, Prior to that, I think I was like 320. Uh, then I lost a lot, came down and kind of told myself, oh, I'm going to stay under 300 again. Then COVID happened. I lost all, all the exercising I was doing in Houston. I wasn't able really to do up here. And despite my best efforts, <clears throat> I ended up gaining a lot of weight. So I was like, think about two weeks before my 39th. I'm like, it's my 39th birthday. We haven't had a chance to do any real partying for a while. I don't really get a chance to go out. I wanted to go out and have a good time. And so I had to try and see what I was going to wear for my birthday. And uh, nothing fit. So I had to go buy clothes. And everything that was my normal size didn't fit. I had to keep going up a bit. I was, I think, pushing a 4X shirt. I was close to about a 50-inch waist. Had to buy a new belt. Had to buy everything. Nothing. So I ended up weighing myself when I got home and I was at about 355 pounds and that was a shock for me. I didn't ever expect it. I think one of the big things big guys hate to do is step on a scale and see how disappointed they are in themselves. We hate doctors. We hate going to the doctors too, because we don't like going and being told we're unhealthy. So you just pretend 
and hide the fact that you know you're getting bigger and mask it as best you can. So I was at 355. I was huge, and but I partied. I had a good time. Uh, people who know me know I love to party. I'm a very social person. I love to cook. I love to eat. I love to party. We go out, we'll drink. We have a good time. And uh, fast forward about a week after my birthday, and I started coughing and feeling sick. And after a COVID test, found out I was I had COVID, which I thought, all right, I'll just you know weather through it. I had gotten my uh, vaccine, so I figured you know I'll work through this pretty well. I think I got to about three days of feeling really crappy, then about three days of feeling great. I was like, man, I'll be ready to go to work the next day. And I think I went back to work and felt like crap. I had to leave early. And then the next day I couldn't breathe. I had trouble breathing. So we went to the emergency room. They checked me in, looked at me. They said my oxygen was fine. But if I have trouble breathing again, you know, to come back home, to keep taking my meds. That's what I did. Next day, woke up feeling worse even more trouble breathing. Um, so we went back to the emergency room, got checked in again, and they decided to say, well, because this is your second time coming, we're going to keep you overnight and we're going to run some blood tests and do some additional things as well. So they take some blood. I call my wife. I tell her I'm probably going to be spending the night. This is December 23rd, by the way. Um, or it might have been the 24th, and no, the 23rd, right before Christmas, I had to call my parents to uh, take my daughter, because she uh, hadn't been around me before any of us had symptoms, and my wife stayed home. So we were all going to be separated for the 24th, assuming I'd get home the 24th, we'd get to spend Christmas Eve together. Uh... So I told my wife we're all disappointed, but you know, hey, you got to do what you got to do, not to die. And the doctors come back after taking my blood, and they told me. So we ran some tests. A lot of things look fine, but your blood sugar is really high. And we ran an A1C, and your A1C was ten point nine. So for people who don't know what A1C is, it's kind of like your average blood sugar for the last three months. You can have high blood sugar one day and not high blood sugar the next day, uh, but the A1C kind of gives an average of how high your blood sugar was for the last uh, three months. And I think between five five and six is average, which is normal range. Um, anything above seven is diabetes. And I was at 10.9. And she told me, you have diabetes. Did you know you have diabetes? And I said, no. It, Runs in my family. My family has a history of diabetes coming at older age, regardless of how healthy we are or uh, skinny we are. And so I knew it would eventually come. I probably used that as an excuse to kind of let myself not take care of myself. I was like, I'll get it anyways. But things were different this time. I had a family. I had a wife. I had a kid. And that hit hard. I started crying in the emergency room. Um, I was scared. So I called my wife and told her that too. Not only do I have COVID, I have diabetes. And things got scary. The doctor came in and said, you know, even with the vaccine, diabetes is a big factor with COVID really affects you a lot harder than it would the average person. So even though I'm glad you got your vaccines, things can get pretty ugly. So you're probably going to stay here for a night or two. So at this point, it was very unlikely I'd be home for the 24th. And I stayed there for the next two nights and fortunately got out on Christmas Day. And I got to at least spend Christmas Day with my wife. I got to FaceTime with my daughter. For Christmas, I got to watch her open her presents with her grandparents, and um, 
you know, and then when eventually my wife ended up testing positive for COVID too, and we both were cleared. She came back home. We got to open our presents with her later on, closer um, to the end of December, early January. So, yeah, it was hard. It was scary. COVID was scary. I thought I fucked myself over that I was, I could have probably did COVID a lot better had I not been a diabetic. I could have probably been less of a diabetic had I been going to the doctors because I hadn't gone to the doctors in three years. I think I went a year before I moved from Texas, a year or two maybe before. So I was avoiding. I only went when things were bad. I wasn't going for my yearly checkups. So then fast forward, I decide, hey, I can't fuck around. I'm going to avoid sugars. I'm even going to avoid alcohol. I don't, I'm like, you know, not a, I'm a big social drinker, but I'm not a big drinker. You know, if nobody came over and hung out with me for a month, I wouldn't touch any booze. But if we went out partying, you know, I'm going to party with you for the whole night and we'll have a good time. The Peruvian way, I think. And I ended up sticking to it. And I think I took my last shot of alcohol on New Year's Eve and said, new day tomorrow, we'll start a new year and I'm going to be alcohol free. I'm going to stick to my a diet. I'm going to make sure I avoid sugars. So when you find you have diabetes, you got to meet an endocrinologist, which took forever to get the referral across and something preserved. It takes forever to get appointments here for anything specialist related. And I ended up having to do a whole bunch of other blood work and seeing my primary care physician after everything, because that was the easiest appointments I could get. Uh, so I met my primary care physician. He said, okay, I'll give you some prescription medications and we'll do some blood work and we'll get you ready so that when you go to your endocrinologist, hopefully it's a little bit quicker and you're able to get the help you need. So we did additional blood work and he called me in and he said, um, can you come in so we can talk? I was like, all right. And it's never good when they call you back in to talk. And he was like, your liver levels are really high. Um, I, uh, I think this one of them was about uh, like a 300 when it should be like 70, 350. Um, and so it was really, really high. And he was like, do you drink? I was like, yeah. He's like, are you like... A big drinker of like I'm a social drinker. I'm not a big drinker, but I haven't drank in a while because I mean a couple of weeks. But I haven't drank in a while uh, since my birthday, really. Um, and I didn't really drink much before that because of COVID. And she he was like, okay, um, well I think we should do a ultrasound on your liver. I was like, okay. So then I started doing research, and you scare the shit out of yourself doing research and figuring out what could be wrong with my liver, what causes your liver to be that high. And, um, you know, early stages, you don't know enough. You don't have enough information. Uh, difficult parts of, I guess, being a doctor is you have to go off of the evidence and the information you know. And not having any of that and being not a doctor, you read everything. And so if you ever check WebMD for a headache and it tells you you might have cancer, it's the same thing. You're thinking the worst things. So I go get my ultrasound. It comes back. And it says I had level four stadiohepatitis, which put me at really high risk. And so the doctor said, but you're young. You seem fully functional. You're not showing any negative symptoms. So you're like, so I don't think it's going to be that bad, but I recommend we get an ultra, I mean, a, um, a biopsy. So the whole time I'm like, all right, well, this thing says I have really bad um liver damage at this point and i went in thinking hopefully the biopsy comes in and tells me i'm okay and it's nothing to worry about i gotta lose more weight stop drinking for a bit and which i already plan to do and i'll get back to normal i'll be partying with my friends in no time i mean I had a trip to Peru that summer. 
there was no way I was not going to go after 22 years and not party with my family. But things don't really work out that way sometimes. I got my biopsy back, and it was actually worse than I thought. I had early stages of cirrhosis, which opened up another shitbox of internet searching and fear. And not knowing what the hell was going on. Most things I read gave me information saying the average lifespan after cirrhosis was five to ten years. Um, and that scared the shit out of me. I had to wait to see a specialist, of course. And appointments take forever. And my liver specialist doctor was not going to be available till September. This was like February, uh, February, March. And then I was able to meet with a gastroenterologist to start me off. Like about, oh, um, it was right before I got this thing. So, but. My appointment with him was until April. And I was not going to wait a month and a half to find out if I'm dying or not. So fast forward, I was able to get an appointment early and talk to him. And he told me, you know, fairly good news. Not great news, but good news for all the negative news I've, had, I've gotten. That so long as you're not really showing symptoms, your liver is still functioning. And there are certain symptoms. Um, but I'm not showing any of that, that there is still possibility of improving myself. Um, and since I'm not a big drinker, like an alcoholic that doesn't stop drinking all the time, the cause is most likely having to do with my weight. So essentially what happens is as you gain a lot of weight, your liver gets fatty. As your liver gets fatty, it stretches and creates, uh, an enlarged liver, which creates scarring. And that scar tissue eventually uh, hardens. And when that scar tissue hardens, that's when you get the cirrhosis. And it's not reversible. Um, I mean, there's some signs that it could heal a little bit more. But generally speaking, when you have the scar tissue, and it's that sometimes they'll tell you have fatty liver and ask you to stop drinking, and you'll your liver will heal itself. But when you get to the point of cirrhosis, that's not really how it works. Your damage is damaged. You just have to try to maintain to live for as long as you can. I just had a two, <laughs> two hit punch on fear. And my only option was to lose weight. So I kind of made that my goal, lose weight. And thankfully, it's been working. You know, I keep telling myself, hey, buy yourself 20 years. And the doctor prescribed me um, my diabetes medicine and Ozempic. And between that, avoiding sugars, avoiding alcohol. Um, I lost about 80 pounds that year. My liver levels went back to normal. My diabetes went into remission all within a year. Um, my A1C went from a 10.9 to about a 6 within 4 months. And then down to about 4.5 by 9 months. And back to about 5 after about a year. So I've been steadily around 5 since then which means my diabetes is remission. But I had to be honest, and I know my history, and I said, I don't want to gain it again, because I always did. I decided to get bariatric surgery, go with a gastric sleeve, something that I always hated the idea of, something I never wanted to. I always felt like I'd be quitting. I'd be doing the cheap route, that I was always strong enough to do it my own. But I couldn't fuck around anymore. 
I have to buy myself 20 years. So, another year of a lot of crap. <laughs> it's a lot of talking to nutritionists, psychologists, the exercise therapists, and a whole bunch of people just to get approved. Um, and then eventually getting approved. Then I was supposed to go in September. I mean, not September, sorry, August, August 28th. I got about one week into my pre-op diet and I was told, and I'm sorry, not told, but I started feeling some pain and I had to go get checked out and nothing related to the, any of my illness or anything, but I had an infection and I had to take antibiotics. And when you're that close to your surgery, you know, 10 days of antibiotics, when you're seven days away from surgery, you want to make sure there's no interactions. So I had to call my my doctor and tell him about it, and they had to postpone my surgery for another month. So one week into a shitty pre-op diet of just protein shakes and broths and water, lost about 10 pounds in one week, and I got told I have to wait another month before I can do the surgery again. What are you going to do? So fast forward. Do another two weeks of pre-op, did my surgery, and I had my surgery uh, this past week. And it went well. I didn't think I'd be in as much pain as I was the first few days, um, but I'm finally feeling a little more normal with myself, which is why I hadn't been able to do my podcast. But this is the next step to my journey for health. Um, but through all of this, I kind of learned that we can't avoid it we can't pretend we we're always going to be healthy it's going to come back and catch up to us especially as we get older we can't hide from it we can't run away from it but we need to be vigilant on it a lot of us don't go to doctors every year we don't get checked up all the time we get hurt and we suck it up and say we'll just keep pushing through it we don't go to therapists for mental health. We don't talk to anybody to help ourselves feel better. You know, all types of health, mental, physical, we ignore it. And I know with for minorities, you know, Latinos and people of color, and we tend to do worse with health, do worse with mental health. Um, and realistically, if you want to succeed in life, you have to live. And if you can't live, you'll never be able to succeed as far as you can. Um, and when you get to a point where you have people relying on you to succeed, it's even more important for you to not fuck around, I think. Because at that point, well, I mean, it's important all the time, but at that point, you have more reasons to stay alive and um so yeah i mean this is i didn't really mean this to be emotional <laughs> just kind of came out that way but i figured hey i'll tell you my story and hopefully encourage you to go to the doctors seek a therapist talk to someone take care of yourself um don't wait till shit's really bad. And if you're overweight, get checked out. Don't pretend you're not. Don't pretend it doesn't affect you because it does. We can only stay healthy fat for so long before we become unhealthy fat. And um, I'm here to talk if you need to. So um, I apologize for this being kind of a different take on things but I thought it was important to be transparent and like with everything in this podcast hope it helps so thank you again for all the support thank you for um, joining in and uh, hope you join me again next time as we continue to learn how to say success in Spanish 